Yeah, my name is Alan Clark, and I'm the director of transportation planning here at the Houston Galveston Area Council. Very pleased to have you here today for this uh, brown bag luncheon, and it's a great uh, honor for me to be able to uh, introduce uh, Robert Eccles, who's the president of the Lone Star High Speed uh, Rail Company. So we're now Texas Central. No, oh, Texas Central. I'm sorry. I, I took that off of uh, something too old. Texas <laughs> Central. Very good. But I've known. Um, I've known Robert for many years, as many of you have. Um, of course, he was a uh, Harris County judge for, um, I hate to say, more than a decade. That makes it hey, well, no, you know. For uh, 12 years, um, he was on the he was the founding chairman of the Texas High Speed Rail and Transportation Corporation, one of the state's first efforts to look seriously at a public-private partnership for developing major transportation infrastructure in our state. And so he really understands the challenge of developing something like high-speed rail in the state of Texas from with his public-private partnership idea. He served as my Transportation Policy Council Chair for over a decade. And so he understands the uh, issues that we are wrestling with uh, our uh, desire to reduce traffic congestion, increase um, choices for transit, bicycling, pedestrian. He understands uh, the dynamics of our growing region and our growing state. And he has a unique perspective on uh, the opportunity that high-speed rail could bring to our state. So it's a great privilege to have Robert here with us today. I could go on more about the things that he's accomplished, but I uh, would like you to help me uh, welcome him as our speaker today for this brown bag. Thank Robert. you, Alan. Thank you. And, and, and I appreciate that. It's nice when they say that for me when I'm not the chair of the TPC, so I appreciate it. <laughs> um, he doesn't have to say good things anymore, and, I, and I'm not running for anything, So, but maybe I should be after that. I don't know. No, no, no. <laughs> I, should. Uh, I am pleased to be here today. We have uh, as Alan mentioned, uh, I had worked on uh, you know, very you know, a lot of different transportation issues over the years. I started the, uh, the Texas uh, Speed Rail and Transportation uh, Corporation, I guess. We, we would go out and try to go around the world, try to get people interested in this. And it has been fun working with people around the state on the issue over the years. Um, and probably particularly today, being MLK Day, I was talking out when the traffic was moving really great today. I wish that, you know, HGAC could take care of it. But so many people were off for MLK's day, and I, Kirby and I were talking a little bit about it this morning, and, and uh, she had the day off as well. And about the message, the King's message of, of uh, you know, content of character as opposed to the color of your skin, and the diversity that we have in our community and how we all come together. And it's not so much that diverse interest, but it's the common interest that we bring those diverse talents together for. And this is a great example of that kind of, of project that makes it so exciting for me coming in as the, uh, you know, the, the, the hat from the private sector opposed, as opposed to the public sector. And so I'm assuming that one of these buttons I punch up here, David, I didn't look at for, am I running this deal here? Is it? There's an arrow, amazing, it goes that right. <laughs> so, um, what we'll do today is tell you a little bit about Texas Central Railway, and the, 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 he, Alan mentioned the uh, Lone Star High Speed Rail, and we starting out naming this, and there's a Lone Star Rail District out of San Antonio, between San Antonio and Austin, and there was some confusion among the regulators about who was doing what out there, and they'd say, oh you, yeah, we read about you in the newspaper, or they'd tell the Lone Star Rail District they read about you in the newspaper, and, so we changed our name so that we wouldn't be confused with a public project. And we'll talk about that today. This is a very much a private project. And it is very liberating, Alan, not having to deal with as many political constituencies as you have to deal with, or Gary, you dealt with at TxDOT, um, and, and, and how our process works and what the steps will go through on it. Again, I did this for years as a nonprofit. We went around the world trying to convince people that there is a business model and a business case in Texas for building high-speed rail. And we went, not on the county's nickel, we'd go on our own nickel to uh, the various high-speed rail operators around the world, uh, the, the TGV in France, the, the, the uh, Alstom TGV process, the Siemens uh, IC in Germany, 
uh, Ave in Spain and their uh, Talgo train systems, the Italians, Koreans with their KTX system. Went all over the world talking about the trains and the oppor business opportunities in Texas. And, and what I found was every place I went, you had vendors trying to sell us as a public entity their technology. They thought we should be buying the rolling stock. And they were looking at this nonprofit that we created that was Houston and Dallas and Brazos County and Temple and, and uh, the Fort Worth folks. Uh, I guess I chaired it. The vice chairs were from Fort Worth and Dallas, commissioners up there. Uh, we were a local government corporation or a nonprofit, but they looked at us as the only entity in the state out trying to, to do this. Uh, that followed on, for many of you that will remember, the 1990s, the early 90s, there was a Texas uh, High Speed Rail Authority that was created. Back, I did that when I was in the legislature, worked on that project. Uh, it went through a process to do a concession agreement in Texas. Uh, there were only two competitors, TGV and uh, the, the Siemens ICE German uh, uh, folks at that time globally working on high speed rail outside of their home countries. And uh, ultimately, uh, TGV won the concession, but never could build a project. So, oh, there's even a trigger on this button. This is even cooler. So, this is our train. Pretty cool. Uh, TCR, the Texas Central High Speed Railway, uh, is here to deploy this uh, N700, our, our uh, system integrator is the JR Central Railways. This is the N700 uh, Shinkansen train. It's their fifth generation Shinkansen. This year they'll celebrate their 50th anniversary of operating these trains. Uh, this train runs 205 miles an hour. Um, they run every six minutes, I believe, a 1,300 passenger train out of Tokyo Station to Nagoya. Uh, it's privately operated, privately run. It was built by the government, but as most government big infrastructure projects are, it was inefficient, and they privatized it. And today it's making money. Um, so it's a, a very successful operation, and uh, our partnership with uh, the Japan Central Railway is a uh, as a system integrator. They are, they're not an investor in our system per se. In fact, they're, they, every time they come to Texas, they get an article, the Japanese are investing in our trains. JR Central Railway is the, the engineering support and it's a system, it's not rolling stock. It is everything from the track to the catenary and the, the control systems. And because they have such a cool system, uh, they've gone 50 years with zero loss of life accidents. Um, it's, 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 they don't mix with freight trains. We'll we probably get into that a little bit as we go through here. So how are we different than what you've seen in the past from high-speed rail proposals? Not, not just here, but around the world. And, and it's really around the world, the Paris-Lyon run makes money uh, for the uh, SNCF system in France. Uh, but that, and that is a true high-speed link. But they, they take their trains and go off of the high-speed rail. Um, the Taiwan system is private, was built privately, had, a, had its share of problems because it was, uh, I don't know, it was, it was multiple pieces that were put together, German technology, it runs a similar train to ours, uh, but it's now starting to make money and do very well. Uh, and then there's the, the, the Japan lines, which were built again as a national railroad, but then divided up into five different railways. This is the most profitable in the, the center segment between Tokyo and Osaka. What we've learned from dealing with these folks is that we are different than the government in that we apply that market discipline to determine where we go and what we can build. I don't have the taxpayers backing it up, so whatever I build, I have to have revenue in excess of cost, whether it's a cost of capital or a cost of real estate. Uh, we're, we're sensitive to those issues. We will deploy the N700 bullet train. Uh, it is, again, uh, operating at 205 miles an hour. Uh, I, I sometimes get in debates with the engineers because I think it'll go faster than that, and, and we may eventually, you know, I kind of push them sometimes. Um, and we are looking to collaborate with uh, American companies. Um, we're not required to follow under the Buy America standards, but largely this project is an American project. The bulk of the money is infrastructure. The motors for this train, for example, can be made by Toshiba right here in Houston. They've got the huge electric motor plant. When I was there, uh, a couple of months ago, they were making motors for the DC Metro and the, the New York transit system. So they're, they're by America qualified organization. So we've got a lot of folks like that to work with in the United States, both Japanese and domestic companies. Um, and more importantly, to collaborate with people like Alan and others in this room. And he mentioned about all the different folks that, that come to the Transportation Policy Council. And when I was chair of that council, I had the, the, the hike and bike guys come in uh, with their 
solution to the transportation problem, and, and y'all may have heard me talk about this before. I have TxDOT come in with their solution to the transportation problem. I had Hector come in with their solution to the transportation problem, the toll road authority, the frontage roads, the transit, you got light rail and transit systems, their solution to the, uh, the, the transportation problem. And what I found was that they were all right, but they all didn't realize that each other was right. The nicest note I got when I left office was from Mike Stretch at Hector. And he said that what he learned working with me was that he was part of a transportation system, that it all works together, and that what one does affects the others. And we understand that, and so we're going to be working closely with the folks that come into the process. Where we go, we want to make sure we don't add to problems and, and make traffic worse in areas where we serve. Uh, and at the same time, we think we can, can again, collaborate and work with locals uh, to future-proof the system for expansion and things, but still do it in a way that makes money and makes economic sense for us. It's just a bunch of people that work with us. Katie, back there. Katie, raise your hand. Sure, picture's on here. David's come back. Some of you may remember David. David worked with me at the county. He went to Washington and was there helping people, and now he's back here. <laughs> so, actually, David was Senate confirmed in the Justice Department. Um, it's scary when he was like number three in the Justice Department. Uh, was at Homeland Security working on those issues with me. I'm excited that he's decided to come back. Then he, then he went into the private sector, and, and we're glad he's back. David Benzion's back here. Wave, David, if you're looking for us afterwards. Uh, David, too. So. Um, it's a, a, a group of uh, financial um, and uh, uh, financial advisors in, out of Dallas. Uh, Fred Wiederhold, the, leading the, uh, uh, st the safety standards, was a former um, uh, inspector general for Amtrak. So we got a lot of people with a lot of experience working on our project. So how did we get here in the first place? I told you a little bit about it. Uh, those of you who have worked with us in the past uh, at HGAC or at the county or working at TxDOT are familiar with some of these statistics. Dallas-Fort Worth, uh, this was the 2010 census, it was about 6.4 million people. Now, I joke with the folks in Dallas, if Travis was here from our team, he'd particularly appreciate it. The way they stay bigger than Houston is they just keep going out further. The Red River, the Sabine, they just keep grabbing a bigger <laughs> catchment area. We're only eight counties, I think there are 21 counties up there now. But today, actually, the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex is at about 7 million people. Um, it's growing very fast. Houston region, the, the eight county Houston region that, that uh, uh, is part of our transportation planning, MPO, I guess, here. Uh, today, it's at about 6.4 where Dallas was since that last census. It's growing tremendously. By 2035, there'll be 25 million people living between these two cities. So we've got a huge population. It continues to grow. Uh, it is uh, an exciting time to be here to watch that growth and what it means for the, the economy and the, the opportunities we have in Houston. It's a great reflection on our community. Uh, and on the Metroplex in Dallas, uh, and you're seeing the same kind of growth in the, the rest of the, the triangle, I guess, Austin, San Antonio, and the, the I-35 corridor. But it's huge growth. Congestion continues. Uh, we drove up to Dallas last week for some meetings there, and, and it's a good four-hour drive uh, uh, today. Um, maybe a little longer when you stop at Bucky's and you know get a Coke <laughs> or coffee or something. But uh, a little beef jerky, but, but it's continuing to increase. Um, those of you who, who drive north from here just know out of Houston, just going from here through uh, Conroe and up through Huntsville, it gets, just that part of the trip gets bad. And if there's any kind of uh, incident on, on I-45, there's really no alternative, and you're stuck with all the trucks and the, the traffic on, on 45 today. By 2035, TxDOT has assumed it'll take up to six and a half hours to make that drive uh, to Dallas given no improvements, and there are no right now planned improvements for the entire route on I-45. The geography between Houston and Dallas, what's really cool about this project is it's not like the Northeast Corridor. As the group went through and looked at different potential alternatives, uh, this one rose quickly, and I think there's a slide a little further down on that, but it's because it's, this is actually a picture from the back of a train between Houston and Dallas. Um, and that's pretty typical of what it looks like on a train between Houston and Dallas. It's a pretty easy construction. There's, there's no uh, seismic problems to worry about like they have in Japan or California. You don't have the population densities, the right-of-way costs that you've got. Uh, and uh, again, it's, you don't have to have tunnels. Our speed is less than 90 minutes. It actually can be a little bit less than that. Even more, Katie, if, I let them go, if they let me go to 250 miles an hour. <laughs> but, um, so again, they, they evaluated 97 city pairs. Um, and looking at the Houston, you can see the, the kind of process that was went through. The, there was a group called the U.S.-Japan High-Speed Rail Corporation, I guess. And they, they, they established and looked at 97 quarters before they ever brought me on. The Northeast Quarter, Boston to D.C., carries more people and generates more revenue. California generates more revenue, has more people. 
But the Northeast Corridor is nine states. You've got an Amtrak legacy carrier. Uh, you've got political and uh, very high right-of-way costs and problems, a lot of challenges in the Northeast Corridor. California is California. We love California. I like going there with my wife. It's not as business friendly a site as Texas, and it, it uh, is more political on its rail system that they're putting in as well. Uh, Texas is a place where we like businesses. We like people that are willing to risk their capital. Uh, we have a regulatory structure that uh, encourages this kind of investment. And uh, so Texas quickly rose to the top of the, the list. And the uh, Houston Dallas quarter, again, with close to 7 million people on each end, um, is the, the, the big high ridership number. Again, Austin and San Antonio link in pretty well, too, but this is the, the, the initially the one that is most bankable. So how do we get there? Uh, the nice thing, too, about Texas is there's quarters that exist. And, and we go through and try to use to the greatest extent possible existing rights of way. Um, and we have railroads that are interested in talking to us and a TxDOT uh, department that has uh, embraced this project and is, is willing to, to help us as well with right of way and grade crossings and the like along the route. Uh, using existing right of way gives us a faster environmental process. Uh, it uh, creates a lower impact on the environmental issues that we have to deal with. Again, uh, less impact on landowners. You know, we're very sensitive to property rights and to the extent we can be in or adjacent to an existing railroad, uh, we, we protect those property owners or impact fewer property owners. And it makes it a lot easier to uh, access and acquire the land. So uh, we're looking at those, uh, those corridors um, and uh, it's, it's uh, you know, the banks have done a multi-million dollar <laughs> investment grade study and they're still you know, convinced that, that we can make this work. Why is that? Again, we're different. Mention a little bit about the market led versus the state led. If I am uh, working for the government and working for the county, we, we uh, or Metro or HGAC, when you procure for the state on a project like this, you're going to go to politically favored constituencies. That's just the world. Uh, the people who elect you are where you're going to go or where you have to get the votes to put the project together. Uh, as a private system, market-led, uh, we're not trying to drive development someplace. We're trying to have development that's easy to drive to. <laughs> um, the promotional efforts led by Texas Central, um, we're going to be using environmental and, and, and uh, economic factors, and the environmental is as much an economic factor as anything else. Uh, private ownership. People around the world tell me when they, they look at, at Texas and America, they say, you don't have the kind of collector distributor system that we have in Paris or in London or in Tokyo or, or Shanghai or something. And, and they're right, we don't. But we do have a collector distributor system. It's called a freeway. So our, our project has to be close to the place most people can get to us. And, and, and we, we look at that. Um, it's, again, it's a good business culture. Uh, unique characteristics in Dallas-Fort Worth. Uh, we will be going, our study will go from the Central Business District uh, of Houston, uh, kind of a little more amorphous kind of station location design from uh, uh, either the current Amtrak, post office kind of location, Hardy Yard, something like that. Uh, Y'all have been doing some work, Alan, on, on some of those potential locations downtown, and we'll pick up with what they've done to downtown Dallas. And. Uh, uh, Again, it will be designed around the JR Central's total system approach, not just a, a track running down the, down the line. Uh, that said, we say one size doesn't fit all. Part of our mantra is the JR Central's technology is great for what we're doing, but it may not work somewhere else. There may be other places they have to do an incremental approach. And so as we look at national standards, we like to see us linked to city pairs, not as a train that you're going to take from here to Los Angeles, because you're not going to take a train from Houston probably to Chicago or Los Angeles or Detroit or New York. Uh, we don't see that as real competition. For the, we're not going to compete with the airlines for those kind of markets. So a city pair, Houston, Dallas, 240 miles, less than 90 minutes, it's an ideal place for us. So we are very sensitive to alignment issues. Alignment drives cost. Alignment makes it longer depending on where you go. Construction delays. Um, I was talking, Gary, with TxDOT at a meeting in Dallas a while back, and somebody said, well, how can, we're on a pretty aggressive schedule. We think we can be operational by 2021. And they were saying, that's a pretty aggressive schedule. And, and it is, but part of that is because we're private and our process is much easier. I don't have to go through the contracting process that a, a, a state entity goes through. And my, uh, in fact, it'll be more, more aligned with what the toll road system would do is trying to build it fast. Right? We're not slowing it down to slow the taxpayer flows flowing in. We've got to build it fast to get revenue generated. 
Uh, we're, we're sensitive to ticket lists, to station location. We want to be someplace where it's easy for people to get to our train and easy to get out when they want to go around the city. We have to have easy connections in Houston to downtown, Greenway, Galleria, Energy Quarter, uh, near North Side, up towards Greens Point, the medical center, the business centers that we think drives this market. And we want to connect as much as possible with other modes. Here in Houston, again, we've got uh, working with, with uh, we'll be working with Tom Lambert uh, prior to that, George and, and Gilbert at, uh, at uh, Metro uh, on uh, connectivity with the, the transit side. Uh, our transit's a little easier because most of it's a bus system. In Dallas, we're working with DART and how we connect into their transit system. And uh, uh, particularly, though, for us, we're sensitive to the freeway access. Uh, we want to be someplace that's easy for people to get to. So, how do we get there? Again, we'll be evaluating alignments. This is actually the 2035 plan from the Metroplex, and I'll, I'll put this up because it is particularly relevant when we talk about the Dallas-Fort Worth region. Because we are serving the Dallas-Fort Worth region, and this is their plan for high-speed rail, that they would have linking a three-station concept, Fort Worth, Arlington, to downtown Dallas. Our model does not take us to Fort Worth, Arlington, and downtown Dallas. It stops in downtown Dallas. So uh, <coughs> it's just a cost issue of getting across to um, Fort Worth, and we'll talk about that in a second. But we are designing our system into their plan to future-proof the system so that it can be in the future if the revenue can be generated or they want to do it themselves. We can be you know, connected into the Metroplex to a greater, and we'll, we'll be able to say, well, here, right here, we'd love to go to Galveston. If we got a plan to go to Galveston and the tracks can be designed to get there, the problem is there's about 40,000 people in Galveston and it's just not enough to pay the billions of dollars to get the track down there. So we go through and we'll go, we'll go through the, uh, the station locations on, on these kind of points, but uh, the short of it is and the primary driver for us is revenue versus cost and the access to our markets. Now last Tuesday, there's been a lot of press more recently on our project. Last Tuesday, the, uh, the Department of Transportation Secretary talked about our project and his quote is up there, but the short of it is that uh, they're thrilled to see their grant being leveraged and we're going to cooperate together to link these two cities. And uh, a lot of people, there were a lot of blogs. I, I have one here, David print ran off for me. See, Alan, I had to read so many little things. I got my glasses out to read this mouse print now. This was kind of the classic response to his deal is, once again, it doesn't matter. It's not gonna happen. The oil, auto, and highway lobbyists are seeding the tea party as we speak and f with false information and scare tactics. The consultants and lawyers, I don't know why people pick on lawyers all the time. Man, I think lawyers are important. <laughs> Maybe more so, Colonel, than the consultants, but um, they'll get paid for the studies and the lawsuits and the project will die. This is the third repeat, Texas Triangle from, from the 1970s under a different name. Uh, once the money for the study runs out, it'll come back in the 2030s uh, under a different name with the same outcome. Um, I get that a lot from people. Uh, it's a comment on a blog, I think, somewhere. Um, we hear that a lot. And what it's important to understand is we are different. Um, what he meant was that they're not paying for this study. We're paying for this study. That's why he's so happy about it. Um, the Dallas to Houston copy said, we're the applicant. We pay for it. Uh, the Federal Railroad Administration and TxDOT will be uh, leading this fight. The private entity can't do an FRA. An FRA is, f or an EIS. The EIS is for the Federal Railroad Administration. So they we're working through an MOU with the Federal Railroad Administration that will, I think actually on this one, even the FRA is the lead and TxDOT is a supporting agency on ours. But it will, will establish our roles and responsibilities for that EIS. Uh, and, and procedurally, the Federal Railroad Administration has been a pretty good partner with us, working to try to expedite the project. They like what we're trying to do out here. The Dallas-Fort Worth-Arlington corridor is different. That's being done by TxDOT. That is a study using public funds. They had a grant from the Federal Railroad Administration, and they're doing that as a separate project that could see how they might link into our project. Uh, but it is do done as two separate EIS uh, processes and the, what, the, what the secretary was talking about was this process will lay the groundwork for the long-term study. TxDOT is also doing studies from Oklahoma City down the Interstate 35 corridor to San Antonio and the folks in the Rio Grande Valley would like that city to go to Laredo and go to Monterey and maybe down, to, down, down further south to uh, Harlingen or Brownsville. That's not our study. Um, and you know, TxDOT will continue with that and how their process works. We're focused on this sole project here, and uh, I think we'll build it before they finish the studies on the other project. Um, so what are our steps? We'll start this formal environmental review process. That means doing a notice of intent, 
probably first quarter March, maybe second quarter April, something like that, get the formal notice of intent, finish our MOU, get the folks, the third party consultants on board, that's FRA is doing that. Um, We've got the formal technology review and approval. I mentioned they've gone 50 years with zero loss of life accidents in Japan. You know, somehow that's not safe enough for America. We've got to go through our own safety standards. And so we're asking for an exception from a standard that doesn't exist. So we're going through that technology review and approval with the FRA. Uh, again, they're working with us. We've got Fred working with us in our group on what that will be. We think there will be some modifications to the trains, uh, ADA requirements here, uh, bigger windows for evacuation. Um, one of the things that was most interesting to me, they did have a fire standard and they, that they wanted it built into the train. It was a half inch steel plate to protect from fire. And we were asking them what the risk was. They said, well, if you hit a truck and it catches fire, well, we don't hit a truck. We're an isolated system. There are no grade crossings. It's impossible to have that kind of accident in this train. In 50 years, they've never had that accident. So they're looking at their standards. But the, the United States has always traditionally had a collision survival model that's designed for trains mixing with freights, that rec have wrecks with freights, or have wrecks with cars or trucks and grade crossings and the like. This system is designed to never have an accident. They know if you're going 200 miles an hour, you're not gonna do too well if you have a wreck, so they just don't have wrecks. And for 50 years, they haven't, um, even with earthquakes and the like. Biggest probably challenge that stays with everything is finalizing the fi plan of finance. Uh, it's a big project, and it's not an easy project, and there's, uh, a lot of support. We've got banks working on the infrastructure, but there's the infrastructure, there's the real estate development, there's the power systems, there's rolling stocks. It's a complex plan of finance that we have to, to finalize to make it work. Uh, but we, we have some, some uh, uh, big, big support from some uh, major players, the Japan Bank for International Commerce, or co Cooperation, and, uh, and others that are working with us on this that, that uh, convinced me that it was going to happen enough for me to go to work for them. All right. So, with that, uh, it is a very exciting project. Um, I'm happy, I guess, Alan, you take questions at these things. And all the years I was at HGAC on the board, I, we had board meetings here. I didn't come to a brown bag lunch. So <laughs> it's an informal group, a small group of folks here. I'm happy to, to hear your comments and what you think about it. And did I leave anything out, Katie? Perfect. All right, all right. I have to bring in the experts from Washington to <laughs> evaluate us. What do you think, David? <laughs> all right. Yes, ma'am. So, why don't you tell them who you are so that they'll pick it up on whatever. My name is Annette Olson, I'm with HGAC, and I was just wondering, is the track going to be elevated over those roads that it does come in contact? Track will be totally grade separated, either elevated over or to underneath will elevate the roads. Uh, there is no place where a car or a truck or a kid on a, on a I, I couldn't go put pennies on the track and smash them like I used to do when I was a kid by the freight rails by us. Uh, it's totally fenced. It is an isolated system. Uh, they have intrusion detection systems uh, that, that see if something crawls. Usually it's like an animal crawls over the line, but you, know, you worry about somebody coming over and messing with the tracks or something, and they, they, they detect that in, in Japan on the system today and, and uh, send someone out to investigate, and typically it's a raccoon or something like that. Um, the train, while it's very aerodynamic, uh, let me go back to the uh, picture of the train here. Um, it's a sleek looking train, um, but it's interesting. It's a, um, it's, it's, you know, it, it doesn't have the big steel cow catcher on the front you might see on other trains. Uh, it's fiberglass or aluminum in the front, but behind that is a pretty substantial structure, so it can hit a 10,000 pound coil on the track and do fine. Uh, the reason the nose on these trains is so long is acoustic. Interestingly, when you start going fast like this, it's all electric, you got the catenary, it's environmentally friendly, much less uh, energy per seat that it runs. But uh, when you start going 200 miles an hour, it gets noisy. You get the, the, interestingly, the, uh, the catenary, you don't see it in this picture, uh, but they've got uh, sound labs in their research facilities over there where they've designed the catenary to be more quiet as it's running through very highly densely populated portions of Japan. And the nose in the front, uh, you could have, if you think about a 737, it's pretty blunt in the front. It, it does fine for aerodynamics. But the nose, particularly as they go through tunnels, it's, it's quieter when they stretch it out a little further. So it's an aerodynamic, it's an it's a, it's a, uh, acoustic, not an aerodynamic function of that nose. It's aerodynamics, but it's more acoustic for, for the, the noise. It's very interesting when you go meet, meet with them at the research facilities. Yes, ma'am. Martin, Megan O'Brien, Raging Contest from 1984. 
question. Do you have plans to have multimodal terminals here in the area, and if so, how many? We have plans now for one terminal, Central Houston, one terminal, Central Dallas. Uh, we were working with the local transit agencies on how we will serve those terminals. Dallas has a much more developed system of intermodal transportation. They got 85 miles of light rail, uh, the TRE, uh, a heavy rail comes into that center as well as the freeway construction and the lights coming into that. So yeah, between the DART and TRE, Amtrak comes in and serves the station in Dallas. Uh, and we will be coordinated with that system uh, in downtown Dallas. Houston doesn't have as developed a system. So we'll be working with, with Houston Metro, with HGAC, with other planners of how we will inter interconnect with the initially probably bus system, because I don't think that we'll be, we're not going to be at one main plaza at the University of Houston where the, the light rail line stops. So we'll have to figure out how we interconnect with the bus systems, the freeways, ultimately uh, long-term plans for rail and how that works. Uh, there's a three-station concept for the Fort Worth Metroplex con connecting from Dallas over to Arlington to Fort Worth. Again, that's not our plan, that's their MPO's plan and they're working on it, but we will future-proof into that system and then work with Alan and others here on how we future-proof into this system for that same kind of long-term connectivity uh, that we'll see in Houston. Initially, our main driver is people in cars coming from a freeway. The same thing you see at Love Field or Hobby Airport is going to be the same kind of traffic we have at ours. And so we have to have good freeway access and easy connection to a rent car, a taxi, or personal transportation, somebody picking them up and dropping them off. So that's probably my first priority is a freeway. But the other stuff is long-term important and nice to have. Do you have any target date for maybe when you, this could be completed? Four we, years? we could be operational by 2021. Um, could be 2021, okay. six years, seven years. It's fast. It's a quick construction project. Yes, sir. Robert Coleman, Hortus Consulting. I uh, just was wondering the buy-in from county commissioners. Is this sure. a factor or is this not a factor in as much as it was in your past? Uh, I can't speak for county commissioners. Um, <laughs> I learned that a long time ago. <laughs> um, we have had a very good response here and in the Dallas-Fort Worth region from the local governments, the counties, the cities, the, the, the local, the, the transit agencies. I have gone to the rural counties between and visited with their county judges, the mayors from some of the cities that are impacted. Uh, their response has been uh, measured. They, they've, they've not. What, what they tend to see, and it goes back to a, a lesson they learned in College Station and Bryan. Back in the 1950s, the congressman from the Bryan College Station region pushed the interstate out of his district. He said, we don't want federal money here. Federal money meant federal meddling, and we don't want federal meddling in our city, so get that interstate and move it over west. So I-45 goes to Huntsville. It doesn't go to College Station. And it has taken 50 years for College Station to get the kind of access, the, the grade separated, you know, 70 mile an hour speed limit roads, the divided highways, they're just finishing those now, coming from Houston and connecting back over to 45 and to, and to the, the uh, Austin San Antonio region. So uh, people saw that. And what the rural folks have so far understood is that if it doesn't come through there, they'll never get a stop. And we, we'll probably have a stop between here and there that serves the Bryan College Station region. That's in our planning right now, is a stop in Houston, a stop in Bryan College Station, somewhere close to that as we can get, and then a downtown Dallas. And then, you know, again, working on with the Metroplex. And there, there may be a market that says we're going to put something north of, you know, Beltway 8 or 99 or something, Woodlands or something like that. But uh, that's not in our current plans. It, it could be. But there's a market there for those. There's not a market to spend 30 or 40 million dollars to build a station in Leon County. But Leon County, for example, or Freestone County, one of the other little counties between here and there. But if we grade separate the, the, the track where the freight's running beside us and we take an overpass, we've we made it a safer place for them because they got grade separations now. And uh, if we have a track there one day, we may be able to do as they do in Japan and have multiple stops and a local train that runs through. So at some point, it may be worth $40 million to build a track, a train station there. So they've so far been at least willing to listen to us and, and have appreciated the uh, small footprint. You know, we, we can build this in a 40-foot right-of-way. Um, I'd like to have 100 feet and have a little buffer, but it doesn't take a real wide. It's not like a you know, big freeway coming through their, their community. Uh, and it's running next to or, or near existing rights rights away so less of an impact yes sir 
Robert, you said something that was a question I've had, which is um, whether or not there could be an opportunity to have um, more commuter-oriented service over a portion of the metropolitan part of the track, sure. or the, the corridor, uh, along with the high-speed service. Given uh, the nature of this, I wouldn't be surprised to learn that this uh, technology is uniquely designed for the purpose that it serves, and it's not necessarily uh, a situation like you had between Washington and New York, where yeah. you might have two or three regional commuters. Maybe they would need to be beside it or sure. some in the, in share of the quarter in some way, but maybe not on the same track. Or does this company uh, have uh, a situation where they operate similar equipment oriented to a commuter market in the same market they're high speed rail now they're going every six minutes they're not yeah, actually they do they, they run a takato shinkansen that runs the stops that goes tokyo to nagoya kyoto and osaka so that's the express train it makes those stops but it's an express train then they have other trains that run the same track the same technology that stop it's a different name but it's the same same service, but it stops many times along the route. They run a local service in there. We have not modeled a commuter function here. Uh, it's the, the, we would love to see the seats full of people going between Houston and Dallas. Uh, interestingly, between Dallas and Fort Worth, it's a 12 minute run on this train. It's, it's a fast train, it's, it's cool. If you stop in Arlington, you had seven minutes. It takes seven minutes to stop from 205 to zero, do a two minute stop, and then get back to 205. It's just a, it's a fast train. So that takes seven minutes to make that, that stop. So it's like 19 minutes if you stop in Arlington between Dallas and Fort Worth. Um, we have not, we don't currently have plans for a second station north of Houston, although I think there's a logic to doing that and, and you know, we'll, we'll look at that at the right time. If the seats are full with people going to Dallas, then I won't want to take the lower cost fare coming into Houston. No, I'm, I'm uh, thinking that, but if, that we yeah. have a different travel market that would be served by yeah. a commuter. We, we yeah. cannot, the one thing that we cannot do on this system is mix a commuter rail with this train. This, right. this train, so this system is designed for this train, so it would have to be just a similar train running a shorter commuter. And we'll contract with uh, Metro or HGAC to do that. We're <laughs> <laughs> let, let, me get back, let me come back here first and we'll come back. Yes, sir. I know it's really early in the process, but have you done any modeling to, to like figure out how, what the frequency might be between Houston and Dallas? Our model right now is 30 minutes at least during peak time, every half hour. Every half hour. Right. And we'd be running an eight-car train in Japan. They run a 16-car train that, that carries about 1,300 people. We'd be running an eight-car train that would carry, you know, 500 maybe. What would the cost be relative? As much as we can charge, we're private. <laughs> no, uh, I, I expect it will be like air travel, where there'll be advanced purchases that'll be less, and there'll be you know business class where you can come in and somebody'll shine your shoes for you, and we'll charge you a hundred dollars for that or something. I don't know. Um, it's a uh, uh, it, it'll, it'll, it's to be established. Right now, we're, we're modeling about eighty percent of commercial airfare for financial purposes, but that will be refined as we move forward. Yes, sir. Do you uh, anticipate owning the owning and operating the station? Yes, we we view the stations and TOD as a portion of the revenue stream for this project, a longer term. But we we see that as important. We do have some slides. I don't have it in here of examples of like the Nagoya station, from when it was first built and what was there is nothing. And today it's got a 50-story high rise and a huge mall that is higher end and bigger than the Galleria here in Houston. Um, so we we do we do think over time that that. The real estate will be a big portion of this, particularly as we tie in, as somebody mentioned earlier about the, the transit agencies, and you start building a true multimodal facility that it, it'll uh, fill out more. You had a question. Yes, I was wondering about the security and time and so forth. I had suggested even to FAA when we had all these problems that we get pre-approval on some so they could just go on right on through without having a problem sure. with maybe a little card or something. Yeah. 
And because they spend so much time loading at the airports, it takes forever. What, a half a day to go from here to Dallas? Almost. By the time you go That's up, okay with us. The little airports can take as long as they want. <laughs> so. I, I was Back. talking about this years, three or four years ago to a group. One woman says, oh, she says, I'll be glad when we get that from Dallas to Fort Worth. She says, I'd rather drive a train and go to the end of and you can drive all the way to Alaska to ride, then ride in the Houston traffic. It's I have suggested the FAA that they, they might even use uh, tights, you know, so everybody could <laughs> wear tights and maybe spray it on. Uh, uh, uh. The, the, um, of course, the, the system, the, the fundamental difference between a train and an airplane, like a 737 or a 747, you can't turn this into a WMD. You cannot take this train and fly it into Texas Commerce Tower or the, the Chase Tower downtown. I, I date myself. Um, Williams Tower, the, the HGAC offices. You can't. You cannot take it off the track. These trains have a, a positive train control. They've got a driver that they're monitoring, and uh, they'll. I mean, if you're riding in the the cockpit up in front with the driver. Uh, and you're going faster, he'll show you, which he'll go a little fast, they'll call and say, you know, you're going a little fast, and, he'll, and they call him, and he'll show you what they do, and then he slows down, and you're going a little slow, and so he keeps on a schedule. He's got a clock on his dashboard that has the seconds of how close he is to his schedule to get to the station, and if he gets ahead of it or below it, they get called on it. They have less than a minute, um, less, I think it's, we always talk about less than 30 seconds, but sometimes they pop in 35 seconds or something like that, and they're very precise. They don't like us saying that about them, but less than a minute delay getting in and out of the stations. And as a practical matter, you probably don't even need the driver because it's all also controlled from a central, central station. So if the guy's going too fast coming into the station, they shut it off. It's just you don't have the problems that you see around the world because the, the safety that's built into the system. So that gets back into the safety of the, the people riding on the train. You don't have to have the kind, it'll be a very passive security. It's not unlike what you see today in the, in the rail, rail, rail traffic in America. I was, took the train from uh, Newark Airport into downtown uh, New York Friday. There's no, well, I'm sure that Amtrak's got police around there and they've got dogs running around the station there at Penn Station, but it's a very passive security and doesn't slow you down. But so. couldn't somebody put something on the track that would cause it to derail? Actually, if they put something on the track, we're gonna know that. They've got sensors that yes. catch people coming in and so we, and we monitor the tracks and so those kinds of issues. They could put a bomb on the train, but I'm not really sure what's in that brown, or that little purse there. there. I'm assuming that's your purse, but. There's everything. Yeah, so. <laughs> Terror, terrorists can, uh, I, I went to law school in Israel, and you're very much more cognizant when you're sitting in an Israeli restaurant that is frequently by, frequented by the Jewish population there to people walking off and leaving bags than we are here. Um, so, yeah, somebody could put a bomb on the train, but you could do that on a bus or, you know, any other, any other mall or something like that. So it'll be a passive security uh, and very convenient for people. And you'll be able to use your iPad, you use your computer, use your phone, watch TV. You know, it's, it's, there's no restrictions like that on the train. It's very smooth. There's, it'll have plenty of ridership. We hope so. I have a, a kid that I was doing, a, I visited the Rotary Club in Tokyo last time I was there at the, at the hotel. And there was a kid uh, from the UK who was giving his presentation as an exchange student. And he had a picture of himself sitting there with a bottle on his head. I kind of think I could balance it now. Riding that train, talking about how smooth the train was. It is an incredible experience. Yes. Yes. Robert, you were called a few years ago when this was uh, set out on the table. The airlines, particularly Southwest, was pretty much opposed. <coughs> created a lot of And I heard you say that the price of this will be about 80% of what commercial air travel will be. Uh, are you, getting any you heard me say we model it at 80%. So watch, be careful, because I get, I get caught. Some, one time I was using an example. Somebody said, what does this cost? I don't know, you know, how much does a car cost? It depends on whether we cross it. $10 billion. All of a sudden there's an article. It's going to be a $10 billion project. I'm not saying it's a $10 billion project, dollar project or something. It's just, I'm not saying it's going to be 80%. I say, that's what our model, and that's a math I can do in my head while I'm talking to you. <laughs> so, um, back, to South. back to Southwest Airlines. Southwest Airlines, very well known in the mid-90s, early 90s as this project came up, <coughs> Southwest organized the Farm Bureau and the rural communities to fight this project. At the time, Love Field, 
served Houston, Texas, adjoining markets. Love Field was constrained by what was called the Wright Amendment. For those of you who are not familiar with it, Jim Wright was the Speaker of the House from Fort Worth. Uh, Dallas was originally going to build the DFW Airport east of Dallas over towards Tyler. They were able to push it back to be mid-cities between Dallas and Fort Worth and actually uh, when they opened it, Southwest Airlines refused to leave Dallas Love Field to go to DFW Airport. Uh, so they passed what was called the Wright Amendment. It was a federal law that prohibited service from Love Field to airports beyond Texas and adjoining states. The Houston market at six and a half million people is bigger than any adjoining state. Harris County is bigger than any adjoining state except Louisiana, and, and it's marginally close to Louisiana today. So uh, Southwest wasn't going to give up that market particularly to a government subsidized project, a, a state project. Today, uh, that amendment uh, expires completely from Love Field. It's been partially lifted, but by the end of this year, I think October, that amendment is gone. And the Southwest Airlines model has changed. They bought AirTran. They want to serve Los Angeles and Seattle and Chicago and Detroit and New York and Washington from Love Field. They're going to be serving Central and South America, Mexico, Central America, South America from, from Hobby Airport. So this is not the big dominant route that it used to be. It costs $200 today, jump in. Katie, what was your ticket this morning? If you flew down? $205 to fly this morning from Dallas to Houston. So, and they're still not making a lot of money on it. So Southwest, I, mean, I don't speak for Southwest, but so far they've been neutral. United and American have both been quietly supportive. Not, not endorsing the project by any means, but uh, their only issue is competition between the two. If we go to DFW Airport, United wants it to go to Hobby or to Intercontinental. Um, if we go to Love, you know, it causes a problem for American and Southwest. So the airports, it's easier just not to go there at all. <laughs> yes, sir. Irv Smith, private citizen. Was attempting on the I-45 route to swing by IIH capture some of that Southwest traffic? Actually, the airports globally do not make money for, for high-speed rail. If I was doing this as a public project financed by the state of Texas, I'd be serving all the airports. But you'd be pay, and you'd be paying for it. <clears throat> they are, but they're not because they make money for the rail line. They, make, they do it because the government runs the rail lines and they want to support the airport. And so there's very few of them that actually make money as a stop for a high-speed train. United has told me, or Larry, back when Larry Kellner, when he was at he was Continental, told me they wouldn't serve an airport in Europe that wasn't served by high-speed rail because they just thought it was important, the linkage. But uh, the economics of the airport is not my issue. Um, I, gotta, I gotta pay for the train. So we will likely have shuttles and we, we will coordinate with the local communities on how they get to the airports. And in Dallas, they have a light rail train that will run from downtown. The Orange Line runs out to the airport now. As a customer, it's a pretty long run with a lot of stops to the airport. If I'm there and I'm trying to get to the airport, I'm probably going to take a taxi. And I think that's what their experience will be. Yes, sir. You see, uh, I'll you come back. Freeway access being one of the more important things. Right. Do you see that being downtown Houston and not freeway access, say, in Woodlands, where it seems to be? Well, you'd have freeway access either place. I mean, any place we go, we're just going to have good access to roads because that's how people get around this community. And, but you see the advantage being. Yeah, at least we, ideally we'd go downtown. Yeah, it, it, you could stop at the 610 loop. I think you got to at least get into the inner city. Our market is inside the loop, west to the Galleria, out towards the Energy Corridor. It's the business people, in the medical center. Um, I mean, we got all kinds of. We'll, we'll work with HGAC and the rail district. We've been working closely with the rail district on what their plans are and how we interconnect everything. It's a question of of cost and riders. So. If I can't figure out how to get through the 610 loop for less than $3 billion, I may not, I may stop at North Line Mall. <laughs> Just, <laughs> that, that, that's, that's what the decision making process that we'll have going into this. And it's, it's interesting though, because Houston is different than Dallas. Houston has grown north and west. Dallas has grown north and west. Coming into Dallas, you're coming from the south. It, there's very little in your way to get there. And there's existing rights of way, so it's pretty easy to get into downtown Dallas. Houston's harder because we're coming through the woodlands. We're coming through champions. We're coming through North Houston. It's, it's constrained coming into the city and you're going through that now in your analysis of, of commuter rail and light rail and everything else. So, but it'll be a function of ridership and revenue. Come over here and I'll come back over this way. Yes ma'am. Do you think, so, so do you have the money now? We have the money to continue with our project now. The bank has not committed, they haven't given me a check for six billion dollars yet, <laughs> but I expect they will.
they've done their analysis and think that, don't write down $6 billion, because I don't know how much it's going to be. <laughs> I'll just throw a number out. $12 billion, the bank hadn't given me any billions of dollars yet. But they continue to go through their process. They have spent millions of dollars on investment grade market studies that show that it's going to still be successful. And so yes, we have, we have a, we are our fi financial plan is evolving now as we speak. We're still trying to figure out the cost. That's that question you asked a minute ago about, you know, where do you go? That's a function of the cost. And it's, it's $3 billion to get from Dallas to Fort Worth. I don't know what it costs to get from the Hardy Yards to the post office on the other side of the bridge, the so, other side of the bio. So as we're looking through this analysis, that will be part of the EIS. We'll get a, a, a better handle on the cost and know what the financial requirements are. We expect it will have a combination of debt and equity and that we will have a return that is attractive to investors for uh, uh, for um, uh, an infrastructure type of project. So you're not going to depend on the federal government money? No, no. We have no, we have no federal subsidy. We have no state subsidy. No, no, no operational subsidy from anybody. And uh, I, I don't know of any grant money out there either. I'll, I'll take it if anybody wants to give me <laughs> But actually, actually, I might not take it because it makes it take longer. And it costs more. Than, than you get, I mean, if, if the county flood control projects, I don't know if you had anybody from, from Hector, that it, it took us twice as long and cost twice as much when we had the Corps doing it. So I love the Corps of Engineers, but it just, we, we just move faster than they do. Robert, you got time for about one more question. I, you got one there in the back. I, I can get two. Yes, I haven't heard this. I, I, I'll, I'll get you, I'll get you, you can wrap it up for me. Go ahead, yes, sir. How are you doing, John? Uh, Ron Cryer, uh, board director of Texas Association School Boards, and uh, board trustees for the ISD. Uh, there are also federal efforts for rail systems yes. that you know, might be in the works. Uh, uh, what's your contingency for such competition? Uh, are you looking to coexist like uh, the Postal Service does with you know, you, uh, you know, United Postal Polls? Yeah, we, like we expect to coexist with our, the entire transportation system. Uh, there is no current federal money available for high-speed rail between Houston and Dallas. There's a study that TxDOT is doing between Dallas and Fort Worth and on the Interstate 35 corridor. There is no money for construction of that. Uh, the federal government has put $8 billion into high-speed rail and I believe will be operational before they are. And that's not really a hit on them because they are public. And they're, they're, they've allocated that money to higher speed perhaps going from 35 to 50 miles an hour up in the you know, Midwest or you know, they're, they're doing a portion out in California, they don't have enough to build a whole project, those kinds of things. They're taking an incremental approach, which is okay. It's just, it's different than what we're doing. And so we are anticipating that we'll build this one privately and that it will be, and I say we're anticipating, we are, if, I'm, I'm still a Republican, we're gonna build it privately. Um, but other places around the country they are working on high-speed rail programs and I expect you'll see those progressing likewise under whatever works for those parts of the country. David. It's hard to stop a train, isn't that what they say? <laughs> um, I, I don't think there are any environmental or construction, technical, social hurdles. I think that people like this project. Uh, the, the challenge would probably be financial if there was some, you know, if we had another tsunami, an earthquake in Japan and the bank wasn't able to get involved or the markets, interest rates go to 20% and the cost of capital goes up dramatically or something. But uh, right now, everything is on track to continue on forward as much as they are for any big infrastructure project. So the challenges in these, these things are always financial. Uh, I guess there could be some regulatory issue, but we got a great partnership with the Federal Railroad Administration and with the Texas Department of Transportation. And they're working with us in, within the process and the structures that are there to try to make this happen. So, you know, given the private financing and the support, <laughs> regulatory support we're, we're getting, we're, you know, cautiously optimistic. Thank you, Robert, for joining us. Thank you all.